Allow me to present you with a hypothetical situation. You've just finished the current expansion of Final Fantasy XIV. You are deeply moved by the characters and the story and the satisfying finale and are just itching to talk about all of the amazing things you saw and experienced. You talk with your FC friend, your static friends, your link shell friends, random people in Limsa, and you are happy. The next day you go into work or school and someone you know asks, hey, how's it going? What have you been up to lately? This is your chance. Oh man, I spent the whole weekend playing Final Fantasy XIV and it was so good. The story just keeps getting better and better. I don't want to spoil anything though, so you should try it yourself. There's a free trial and everything, insert meme here. You manage to convince this normie to give your nerdy MMO a shot, and then you remember. You remember that before the cool dragons, before the samurai, and the dark knight, and the apocalypse, there's that. The beginning is a real slog, you warn. But once you get to Heaven's Word, it gets really good. While I said this is hypothetical, I'm sure you've already seen or even experienced this story before. Despite the dev team's attempts to shorten A Realm Reborn by removing superfluous quests and recently revamping several dungeons, as well as the entire ending of 2.0, the common advice of ARR sucks, power through it to get to the good stuff, still stands. But why does everyone hate A Realm Reborn? What is it that makes it quote-unquote a slog? In this video, I'm going to explore the reasons why people don't like A Realm Reborn, as well as some of the good things about ARR that many players may have overlooked or forgotten. Now, before we get to the explanation, I just want to gloss over one thing very quickly. Yes, the failure of 1.0 and the very tight schedule of the 2.0 release played a large factor in the outcome of A Realm Reborn's story and presentation. I think most people familiar with 14 know that by now. I don't plan to put much emphasis or weight on it, and instead would like to focus on the poor narrative choices that lead to frustration in the new player experience. I will also not talk about gameplay design or job progression, as I believe many others have already discussed that aspect in detail. This video is strictly about the story experience itself. Okay, now let's get into it. So let's talk about Titan. Specifically, the Company of Heroes questline that leads up to the fight with Titan. The main complaint that people have about this line of quests is that it's long and boring. We are going to break down why that is and how the problems with the Titan quests represent a larger problem in A Realm Reborn. To start off, let's look at the plotline itself. You are tasked with stopping Titan, and in order to do so, need the help of Weiskit. He does not think you are capable, so orders you to complete a series of trials to prove your worth. Now, actually, this setup is repeated multiple times throughout A Realm Reborn. The Scions send you to investigate Ramu. The Sylphs don't trust outsiders, and you need to win their trust through various deeds to resolve the conflict and complete your mission. The same happens with the Alamegans and the Ishgardians. While each respective questline may vary in quality, players are willing to accept the in-universe justifications for the character's actions. So why don't the Company of Heroes get a pass like the Sylphs or the Alamegans? It comes down to what the interaction means to the player. Much of A Realm Reborn is about beginning an adventure in an unfamiliar land. Starting off, we don't know anything about Eorzea. But as we progress through the story and different areas, we learn about the various peoples and cultures that inhabit the world. When we meet the Sylphs, we learn that not all of the Beast tribes are hostile, which is in contrast to what we saw of the Amalja in the previous set of quests, and serves to further enhance the complexity of relations between the various tribes and nations. This also sets up the possibility of friendly tribes that we see later in the optional Beast tribe quests. 
When we meet the Alamegans, we learn about how the Garlean Empire has affected other nations, thus increasing their threat to Eorzea. We learn about the difficult lives of the refugees and the fierce pride and stubbornness in Alamegan culture. When we meet the Ishgardians, we learn about their isolationist tendencies, the complex relationship between the four high houses, the unquestionable power of the Holy See, and their centuries-long conflict with dragons. And when we meet the company of heroes, we learn that heroes in this world are dicks. The obstacles the Sylphs, the Alamegans, and the Ishgardians put in front of you, the player, come from their culture and their place in the world. So their motivations feel genuine, and we are able to sympathize with them, even if they cause us frustration. The company of heroes has no such justification. The best we can give them is that they are mercenaries, and the fate of Eorzea just isn't that important to them unless they get money out of it. But that justification has its own problems. If, for instance, the Warrior of Light gave up on the company's trials partway through and instead found their own way into Titan's chamber, that would tell us, the player, how the Warrior of Light measures against established heroes in Eorzea, showing they have the true qualities necessary to best not only primals, but the Empire as well. That would be great setup. Or if Gegeruju was actually the one in charge and keeping you from reaching Titan, we would have learned about the greed and corruption of Lollifels, which would be great foreshadowing for the patch content later. As it is, there is very little reason for the player to sympathize with Wysked, and instead we find ourselves wishing the Warrior of Light would just grow a backbone already. This problem is further exacerbated by the fact that the game itself, the characters in the world, fully acknowledge that the entire venture is a waste of your time. From the beginning in Wrath of the Titan, it is made explicitly clear that 1. Titan is much more powerful than Ifrit, so much so that the Warrior of Light is given the opportunity to back out, and 2. This threat is imminent. Titan has already been summoned. However, when you go to deal with this threat, you are held back, as discussed earlier, for no good reason at all. This creates a kind of conflict whiplash, wherein the established stakes are removed by the story itself before the payoff can take place. By the time you are able to finally fight Titan, you are more bored and frustrated than excited because the tension leading up to that moment has been pulled out from under you. This is the first of two major problems with the story of A Realm Reborn. Before we get into the second problem, let's look at some more examples that illustrate this first issue of interrupted tension. During the Sylph quest line, we are tasked with finding the missing Sylph Elder, and end up at Buscarin Struthers to find more information. Instead of focusing on the known problem whose outcome could make or break your diplomatic relationship with the Sylphs, the game has you drop everything to… help make a bottle of wine for Buscarin? Only after which do you go to rescue the Elder in Totorak. We already talked about the Company of Heroes and how it stalls the threat of Titan with what amounts to side quests, one of which also includes making a bottle of wine. Seriously, what's with the wine thing? Immediately following Titan, we return to the Waking Sands to find it ransacked by the Empire. We see through an Echo cutscene as our leader and other known NPCs are kidnapped and taken away. The Warrior of Light's response to this is basically, oh no, anyway. As instead of immediately trying to find out where they are and rescue them, we run off to Corthus. It takes 35 quests to begin the quest line to go save them. This is, I feel, the most egregious example of interrupted tension. Even within the interrupted plotline, there is another interruption, as we are sent all over Eorzea searching for a corrupted crystal in order to enter Garuda's sanctuary, which further lowers the tension as we have already spent a considerable amount of time wandering around Corthus to get the airship. While this one isn't the result of people purposefully getting in your way, the negligence of both the scientists you talk to and the Warrior of Light in properly communicating what kind of crystal you actually need turns it into a very frustrating experience. So why does this keep happening? Why does the story keep having these perfectly good setups and fail to follow through on them? 
I mentioned before how there are two major problems in a Realm Reborn story, and this first one is caused by the second problem. So let's go back to the Company of Heroes. What exactly are you doing in these quests? We already know about the why of it, but what are we asked to do? Well, we go around to a bunch of different places and do things for people. Which can describe most of this game. Or most games in general. But I digress. In fact, during the Titan quest line, you visit seven different locations. Seven new locations. Seven locations the game wants to introduce to you, the new adventurer in Eorzea. I think you get the point. While most stories are either plot-driven or character-driven, A Realm Reborn is largely driven by its setting, shaping the plot around where you need to go next rather than what you need to do next. That's why we have such persistent annoyances like the Company of Heroes quests and the Corrupted Crystals quests, where there are clear and obvious reasons to object to the story beats because, well, the quest isn't really about the story. It's about you as a player interacting with the world that's been put before you. You have to visit Wineport and the Sogoli Desert. You have to be introduced to the Isles of Umbra, whether or not there's a good reason narratively for you to go there. This also explains things like the Hockey Manor quests, which serve no obvious purpose after we already chased the Astian presence in Little Alamigo, as well as the number one worst quest in the entire game. A Hero in the Making A Hero in the Making is the Remembrance Ceremony quest where you go around visiting all of the city-states. The purpose of this quest is to give some lore and context to each of the three city-states in order to help you choose a grand company. It is also to properly introduce us to Alize and especially Alfino, who joins us later in the MSQ. On its own, this is not a problem. However, this quest comes after the Envoy, which has you going to all three city-states as an excuse to open the world map, as well as the three dungeon quests, which have you complete, well, three dungeons, to familiarize you with each of the different areas after unlocking them, as well as to introduce you to the two city representatives you haven't yet met. To ask the player to make the same loop a third time is egregious and, on some level, a waste of time. But I think in the end it comes back to that focus on the setting over the characters and narrative. There is no reason why our introduction to Alfino needed to be wrapped up in a lore dump about the city-states. We just as well could have met him at the Waking Sands, or have him ask us to resolve a problem that shows his motivations and drive as a character. Double points if the problem was his conflict with Alize. As it is, we are ripped from the primal quest to take part in a thrice-redundant ceremony, and then, as soon as it is finished, dragged away to restart the primal quests as if nothing had happened in between them. I will also say that this is the reason why the Garuda fight through to the final cutscene are considered the best part of A Realm Reborn. This is when the story starts to solidify into one main plotline, where the primal story and the empire story converge in a way that raises the stakes instead of lowering them by suddenly dropping one for the other. The empire only arrives after you defeat Garuda, thus fulfilling the payoff for Alfino's call to action. This is done before introducing the Ultima weapon as the next hurdle to overcome. What we get in the later part of the base game leads me to believe that if the dev team had been given more development time, they would have ironed out many of the problems we went over in this section. I don't think that A Realm Reborn is a bad story by any means, but I do think it consistently fails to deliver on its promised story beats by yanking the player's attention along from one subplot to the next. As a result, it also relies far too much on exposition to carry what should be character-building moments. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's talk about characters. As with the story, there are two main problems with the way characters are presented in A Realm Reborn. The first is, once again, tied to the settings-directed nature of the narrative. 
Because the player character must be introduced to a large number of locations in a relatively short amount of time, we must also be introduced to the characters who reside in those locations. As a result, there are simply too many characters to keep track of, and it becomes too difficult to know who is important and who is not. Who would have guessed that Laurentius, of all people, would return in the patch story? Do you remember Riol? No? He's an important character who appears for half a quest to help you reach Titan. But we can feel the effects of this even before the patches. By the end of A Realm Reborn, I felt I knew more about Francel than I did about Ida, and Ida is supposed to be a main cast member. But with so little time to devote to each character before moving on to the next area and the next subplot filled with even more new characters, it's really no surprise at all. The localization does its best to make dialogue flavorful, sometimes too much so, in order to help the audience easily distinguish between characters, but that has its limits. The number of characters and their necessity in moving the plot along, as discussed earlier, makes it so we just barely scratch the surface of each one, so they all end up feeling paper thin. Basically, there are a great quantity of characters, but not much quality except in rare circumstances. Another issue that arises from the need to quickly shuffle the player from place to place is an overabundance of exposition. There is not a lot of time to slowly explore ideas and build them up. We have to hurry up and get this lore out, finish up the subplot, and get on to the next one. And this is how we end up with large blocks of text like your introduction to your starting city, the introduction to the scions, and... <sighs> the Remembrance Ceremony. Excessive exposition takes the place of character interaction, and we end up leaving a conversation with a lot of new information, but not much understanding about the person who gave the information, or even the one who received it. Speaking of one who receives lots of information, the second major problem with the Realm Reborn's characters is actually a problem with just one character. The Warrior of Light. Silent protagonists can be done well, but it requires one of three specific conditions. The first condition would be focusing on gameplay over story. There are arguably only two main components to any video game, gameplay systems and story. If you have a silent protagonist in a story-heavy game, the inability of the protagonist to meaningfully contribute to the conflicts in the story becomes more and more apparent as time goes on. To avoid this, some games with silent protagonists shift the focus to gameplay instead, leaving the story to a minimum. This allows the player to express agency through their actions using the character rather than being simply an observer. As most silent protagonists are silent in order to be a placeholder for the player, this works extremely well. One good example of this is Breath of the Wild where the gameplay takes precedence over the story, so much so that you have the option to beat the final boss right after the introduction. The second option is to focus on the supporting cast. So let's assume you want a story-driven game, but also want a silent protagonist. You still need conflict in the story in order to have a compelling narrative and create tension. But you cannot use the main character because, as stated earlier, they need to be a placeholder that the player can project onto. Your easiest solution, then, is to turn to the supporting cast. By having strong supporting cast members, they can be the ones to express conflict and give reactions to events the way the main character cannot. Dragon Age Origins is a great example of this, as all of the party members are extremely fleshed out and have their own storylines. You can invest in the story beats because you can invest in your party members. This also allows player choice in how you choose to react to those supporting characters' decisions. Some of this is represented in-game, and some of it is not. Final Fantasy XIV, to its credit, also leans into this very heavily in later expansions, creating a well-rounded and likable supporting cast that helps carry intense story moments. But not so much in A Realm Reborn. The last option is to give the silent protagonist ways to express themselves, or in fact to express the player, through environmental interaction. How does the player handle this interaction, this mission, this choice? 
Recently, Baldur's Gate 3 blew everyone's socks off by focusing on player choices that result in branching outcomes. This is probably the hardest method of integrating silent protagonists, since the game itself will need to react to the actions of the player in various ways, and that's usually why it falls flat or is reduced to option A versus option B. Now that we've properly looked into the necessary conditions for a good, well-integrated silent protagonist, let's check out the Warrior of Light in A Realm Reborn. Option 1. For better or worse, 14 and most Final Fantasy games are heavily story-driven, so we cannot rely on gameplay to mask the protagonist's lack of expression within the story. With option 2, as I said earlier, 14 does end up using this method in the expansions, but because of the other issues in A Realm Reborn, mainly the need for copious amounts of exposition, the supporting cast is not in a position to carry the conflict in the story. Though I will say that the likability of characters is, in the end, subjective, so you may find the supporting cast compelling for… certain… reasons, despite not being fully realized characters. And as for option 3, there are no branching paths in 14. Everyone gets the same story experience. Looking at these two problems, we can perhaps forgive the first ten-ish hours of the game for being on the bland side. You have a new world to introduce the player to, and a brick wall of a character to contend with. It's not an easy sell, but there is potential. The world itself seems interesting, with its various tribes and large cities, and an expanded free trial which you can play through the entirety of A Realm Reborn and the award-winning Heavensward expansion up to level 70 for free with no restrictions on playtime, now with even more Stormblood. People are often willing to stick through some tedium if there is enough of a promise of a good payoff. And that's when we get to the Scions. The introduction to the Scions of the Seventh Dawn should be the meat and potatoes of the story. They should be where everything opens up into a grander narrative, not simply more places. And to be fair, in a way it is. This is the point at which we are introduced to the Primals and the Empire, two of the main driving forces behind the plot. However, the Scions are not that interesting or memorable because of the two main problems discussed earlier. Firstly, each of them are tied to one of three areas, each with their own plotline. You only hang out with Thancred and Thanalan, Eda and Papalimo in the Shroud, and Yastola in Lenosha. This is the case because we must have someone to push the player to go to the correct place and do the thing that needs to be done to move the story along to the next set piece. Because of this, they are often there simply to either explain something to the Warrior of Light or tell them to do something. This is not very compelling, and it also doesn't show agency on the part of the Scions. They often stand around not actually assisting the Warrior of Light in any meaningful way, which makes them appear both bossy and lazy. This is coupled with the fact that the Warrior of Light cannot interact with either them or the problem they currently face, which puts all of the pressure to make the scene interesting on someone who doesn't have the free time to actually be a character in between their exposition. This makes it even harder for the player to sympathize with them or their cause. I think it would have benefited the game overall to introduce us to the core cast early on, and either have them accompany us, or show what they are doing in interspersed cutscenes as the player progresses. And we do get some of that, with the one scion attached to your starting area, which means that the other scions remain largely unexplored and unknown unless you restart the game and play through another starting zone. Aside from the main four, Minfilia is almost not worth mentioning at all. She is locked in her office and never leaves to play any meaningful part in the story, and when she does get out, it's because she's been kidnapped, so she still can't offer any character insights because we only get a few short glimpses of her time spent captive. Of course, the explanation for this lack of attention given to the captive scions is that the story is about the Warrior of Light, so that's where all of the focus is centered. Regardless of whether or not this is a good thing for the characters surrounding the Warrior of Light. Arguably, the most strongly presented character in A Realm Reborn is Alfino, because he's an arrogant brat. 
and because he participates in the story in a way the other scions do not. He helps Sid remember who he is, he helps you find the Enterprise, and he helps in the fight against Garuda. It's just unfortunate that he's kind of insufferable. Though, to be fair, that is the point. Sid comes in second after Alfino for the same reasons. Though I think the sudden focus on him in the second half of the base game, after giving so little attention to the main cast of Scions, can come off as confusing to newer players who are not familiar with his role in 1.0. I know I certainly wished for some kind of flashback for the Scions that explained their motivations in as much depth as Sid received. One last thing about the Scions before I move on. We have to talk about Thancred. As stated before, Thancred has his own set of companion quests where he accompanies you and Thanalan about a possible summoning of Ifrit. This set of quests begins at level 17 and ends at level 20. He makes brief appearances in three other instances. Level 20 self-management, level 24 back from the woods, and level 30 wrath of the titan. I know. I checked. The reveal that he is possessed by La Habrea is in the level 46 quest Escape from Castrum Sentry. This means that there are 117 story quests between his last major appearance and the twist, and 70 story quests between his last minor appearance and the reveal. For reference, there are around 165 story quests in the base game in total, depending on your starting city. This is, of course, after the trimming down of the story in patch 5.3. Now, imagine that you are a new player going through these quests for the first time, and somewhere in the middle of the story you get distracted by crafting, by fishing, by glamming, or the gold saucer. More time away from the main story makes it more likely you will have forgotten key points and characters. This is made worse by the fact that, even within the story, you don't encounter these important characters often enough. And if you were anything like me, by the time you reached that twist moment, you'd already completely forgotten who this pretty boy even is. However, more than character issues, this is connected to how the story itself is structured, which we have already discussed at length. Up until now, I have not had a chance to talk about the villains in the story. They suffer from a lot of the same problems that the heroes do. Wilred and the Inquisitor stand out as being quite good. They each have strong motivation and presence in their respective stories, while Laurentia stands out as a huge missed opportunity and deserved his own real questline. The primals are a good idea, but the execution is rather dry and doesn't take advantage of the nuanced issues they're summoning hints at. I think the best example of this is with Titan, funnily enough, where we are told at the beginning that the kobolds only summoned Titan because Limsa broke their treaty. But that detail is almost immediately swept aside as unimportant. Can you imagine if instead of the company of heroes we got a diplomatic mission similar to the Sylphs, where we attempted to talk down the kobolds? But instead, it resulted in some explosive breakdown in relations that led to the kobolds sending Titan on a rampage in Limsa. Now that would be interesting. But instead, our best moment with the primals is when Ultima eats them. Which is admittedly really cool, but doesn't make full use of their potential. Speaking of the Ultima weapon, it might not be obvious if you've only played through the story once, but did you know that the Warrior of Light does not meet Gaius until the scene at level 44? Every instance until then has been a cutscene for the player. The Warrior of Light has no interaction with the Empire leaders until the actual final quests of the main story. This isn't necessarily a bad thing, and I think the cutscenes we do have give a good idea of who these characters are, even if they are exposition heavy. But knowing who they are is not the same as feeling like they are a threat or a source of conflict for the heroes. And in comparison to later villains in the expansions, Gaius and his entourage end up being underwhelming. There are hints of good character moments, but rarely with any proper follow-up. And of course, a discussion about the villains would be incomplete without mentioning the Asians. They're... fine, I guess. At times they come off as generic, 
especially La Habrea, who is an unfortunate, mustache-twirling, maniacal, laughing bad guy, one which the devs have attempted to go back and flesh out as much as possible with the addition of new lore for the Asians that came from later expansions. I think of all of the plot lines in A Realm Reborn, the Asians come out looking the best from a storytelling standpoint, but that's only because they appear so sparingly and reveal so little about their own motivations other than, we want to cause chaos and destruction for our god. Because their plotline is left unfinished at the end of the base game, despite the defeat of La Habrea, players are left with a sense that there's more to look forward to and therefore are more willing to reserve judgment until they see the conclusion to the arc. I suppose my only critique would be that they are not very threatening, despite being the instigators of most of the conflict we encounter throughout A Realm Reborn. In the end, the problems with the villains and the way they come across once again ties back to the main problem of the story. Tension is actively reduced by competing storylines interrupting each other in service to the setting. Alright, now that we've broken down both the plot and the characters, we've got some loose ends to tie up. Originally, I wasn't going to talk about this, but I realized that there are many people who would be confused by an omission of the patch content, since it is technically connected to the base game. So, here's a relatively short breakdown about why people find the patch content after A Realm Reborn a slog. The biggest factor is a lack of progression. Because the patches are built with the idea of being at level cap, there's no need for building experience, and the rewards for completing MSQ quests are almost non-existent. However, you are required to complete them in order to progress to the next part of the game. This creates a kind of dissonance where some players don't actually want to do the patch content, but push themselves to do it because they know they have to. By going in with this mindset, players are preconditioned to be dissatisfied with the content in front of them. This sentiment is usually offset in the expansions by providing follow-up conclusions to remaining threads in the base story, with the point 0.1 to point 0.3 quest being a conclusion to the current expansion, and point 0.4 to point 0.55 being a setup for the next expansion. I would argue that both A Realm Reborn and Endwalker suffer from the same problem in this regard. The base story is well and truly wrapped up, with minimal continuing threads to draw on for player engagement. That means the beginning of the point 0.1 patch has to do a lot of heavy lifting, it's supposed to start a new arc, while simultaneously offering the player very little reward for their patience in the building of that arc, and it's in the position that would naturally belong to a continuing story. After all, when you think of a new story arc, you think the beginning of an expansion, not the beginning of a set of patches. So when people complain about the Realm Reborn patch content being a slog, they are almost always referring to patch 2.1 through patch 2.3. In the patch cycle, these sections would be devoted to the wrapping up I mentioned earlier, but because of the way A Realm Reborn ended, this is instead devoted to a long, meandering setup that brings in threads of various different storylines that will be paid off much further down the line. Another issue that comes about with the patch content is the current player experience compared to the launch player experience. When the patch content first came out, it was delivered in short spurts that, while perhaps not the most interesting, didn't overstay its welcome, and left a few breadcrumbs to build anticipation for the future. Now, however, the patches are all available at the outset, looking to many players like an obstacle in the way of their enjoyment of Heavensward. People then grind through the patches as quickly as possible, and afterwards complain that the grind wasn't fun. Lastly, if you look at a breakdown of patch quest numbers, A Realm Reborn far outnumbers all expansion patch content. Just for comparison, patch 2.3 currently has 14 quests, while patch 3.3 has 6. Patch 2.55 has 16 quests, while 3.56 has 4. The post Heavensward quests are many times longer individually but I think A Realm Reborn patches feel like they tried to stick half an expansion's worth of story into what should have been a victory lap. That causes the sense of dragging that many people experience. 
Fundamentally, the problem with the post-ARR patches is not the story itself, it's where the story lands in both the overarching narrative and as a progression point in the game itself. Which is ironic considering the patch story is basically what they were trying to make in the base game. A set of separate but interconnected stories that come together at the end into one cohesive narrative. But in the end, CBU3 rightfully learned their lesson and improved the patch experience in the expansions. Until Endwalker. But we're not going to talk about that one. Alright, so I'm going to get this out of the way right out the gate. One of the main reasons that new players hate A Realm Reborn is because of other players. Yes, I know I just spent a ridiculous amount of time explaining all of the problems in the story and characters, but to be completely honest, most people like to have a good story in their game, but don't need to have a good story to enjoy it. A game like 14 has so much content to offer that once you get far enough into it to enjoy those things, the story becomes icing rather than the whole cake. The real problem that faces A Realm Reborn is perception. If we time travel back to 2013 when A Realm Reborn first released, it was praised not just for being an improvement over 1.0, but on the merits of its story. People thought it had a strong start, and did a great job building up the foundations of Eorzea and the world of Hydaelyn. The Asians were this interesting, mysterious threat. That ending scene of the Asians gathering in that weird little dungeon was an honest, genuine cliffhanger. Paradoxically, Final Fantasy XIV has been overshadowed by its own success. Throughout the 10 years since its launch, the story has pushed further and further to more and more praise from its audience. The highs have gotten higher, and looking back at the beginning seems like such a low point in comparison. But the thing is, you have to get there first to see it. Remember my hypothetical scenario from the beginning of the video? Remember that the veteran player felt the need to justify A Realm Reborn? To warn the new player about it? Yeah, stop doing that. You're making it harder, not easier for them. The Realm Reborn you remember is not the one they are going to play. The devs have committed to making continued improvements to the base game. They know there are weak spots. They know the audience has higher expectations now. We have seen a reduction in quest bloat, the introduction of dungeon NPCs, overhauls of dungeon layouts, and reworks of instanced battles. Guys, if you have not, please, for the love of God, play through the Rejatine and La Habrea fights at the end of A Realm Reborn. They are so, so good, especially Rejatine. Castrum Meridianum and the Praetorium have also been significantly improved. You don't have to level with fates and side quests to meet MSQ level requirements anymore. The Gold Saucer was added, and if you want to, you can play all of it for free anyway. For a veteran that started 10, 8, 6 years ago, they might not realize that all of these changes significantly improve the experience, which is why their perception will be skewed in a way that a new player's won't be. And I say that as someone who has watched friends give up on 14 in A Realm Reborn, who made this video because a good friend quit halfway between Ifrit and Titan. There are problems with the story, but preempting people with the story sucks guarantees they are going to go in thinking they will have a miserable time. They will then be miserable and quit before quote unquote getting to the good part. If you let it, A Realm Reborn can be the good part. And before we get on to the last section of this video, I want to do a lightning round of all of the good things in A Realm Reborn. There is clear and varied world building with a commitment to speech styles and cultures. Every race and every location has its own backstory and lore. Background characters have unique dialogue that changes throughout the course of the story and shows that there is a world happening outside of the main story beats. The musical score and environmental design are really good. I think it's easy to overlook these things because we have kind of come to expect them, and it goes without saying that the music is great, but alongside that the environments are unique and full of character. 
and there are some interesting hidden gems if you go looking for them. The amount of content available to players during A Realm Reborn has increased. Of course, there's fates, crafting and gathering, fishing, beast tribe quests, housing, alt jobs, FCs, and glamour, but there's also the gold saucer, chocobo racing, triple triad, mahjong, squadrons, hildebrand, bahamut raids, relic weapons, pvp, palace of the dead, blue mage, samurai, and red mage. Admittedly, some of these only become available at level 50, but it is still considered part of a realm reborn. It's just unfortunate that a lot of people will skip over this content because they feel like they have to do the MSQ first. There are several nods to 1.0 for legacy players. Alfino is Louis Soi's successor, not just in blood relation, but in his goals and aspirations. Sid's backstory references his involvement in the 1.0 story. Gaius is a much cooler villain if you remember him from 1.0. Meanphilia actually has a character if you met her in 1.0, and in the early game there are scions who are members of the Path of the Twelve who are later killed by Livia. The patch content is really good. I haven't talked about it much because it's not part of the base game, but the lead up into Heaven's Word is phenomenal and well paced. Also, the Bahamut Raid has still never been topped, don't at me. This next one is a bit anecdotal, but there's something really homey about the base game. It's pleasant to play through. All of the threats and problems are local and contained. There's nothing earth-shattering, nothing truly catastrophic happening. It, it's almost quaint in a way. You really feel the progression from being a nobody adventurer just setting out to defending the place you have come to call home. Too many stories feel like there are no stakes unless they are the highest stakes imaginable, unless you have to save the world or else, and in that regard, A Realm Reborn is a breath of fresh air. Lastly, for all its faults, A Realm Reborn does have that Final Fantasy magic, that feeling of adventure and wonder, that magic of discovery that has always made Final Fantasy something special. Of all of the expansions, I have actually played through A Realm Reborn the most, and I've enjoyed myself while doing it. No, I do not have an alt problem, thank you very much. Sometimes I play through A Realm Reborn for the comfort of it, sometimes for the nostalgia, and I know not everyone has this same experience or fondness for the base game. I totally get that. But that doesn't mean it should be wholesale rejected as drudgery when there is actually a lot that it offers to the willing. Just kidding. This isn't a problem with the dev team. They're wonderful and I love them. They don't always hit, but they always try. And no one can reasonably look at A Realm Reborn and call it a failure. No, this is actually a section for the devs. When I first began making this video, I realized that I was doing a lot of complaining and a lot of nitpicking. I'm not the kind of person that just enjoys being negative, so I felt that I should at least provide some suggestions for how to alleviate some of the problems I've pointed out. But therein lies another problem. When I started thinking about my suggestions, I came in as a story enjoyer. But this isn't a book. It's a game, an established game, and that introduces the need for compromise between the game systems and the narrative in ways simply creating a story wouldn't. Let's take as an example the Hockey Manor storyline. If it were up to me, the entire thing would be removed. However, removing the dungeon would remove an orchestrian role, leveling and glamour gear, blue mage spells, a triple triad card, crafting materials, and a leveling option for alternate jobs. Aside from the dungeon, this would remove lore details about the aftermath of the Calamity, the nature of Void Scent, and some minor details about Gridanian culture. So now our simple fix to a narrative problem has become a... Nightmare! <laughs> <laughs> the work the devs have already done in improving the Realm Reborn experience shows how much time, effort, and resources go into these improvements. And while it's obvious they're willing to dedicate those resources, there are limits. So with all that in mind, here are my totally probably dev-friendly suggestions. Suggestion number one. 
add interactivity to the opening sequence. While the opening is okay on its own, it is a bit of a slow start, something honestly most Final Fantasy games seem to struggle with. My two options would be either to allow the player to execute a Limit Break 3 in the opening clash, perhaps using the duty action implemented in Stormblood, or to have the player take part in the skirmish with the beast tribe of their starting city by playing as one of the guards. The goal of both would be to give the player something exciting to look forward to, something a bit cool to kick off so they have a concrete image to look forward to rather than a vague expectation that the game will have something interesting in it at some point. Both have their downsides, but they seem perfectly doable. Suggestion number two, revamp the level 5 and level 15 instance battles. Given that they have already revamped Ritatin and La Habrea, this seems very likely. I wouldn't be surprised if it's already in the works, or at least has been considered. I understand the dev team wants to make the experience casual and newcomer friendly. I really do. But casual doesn't mean brain-meltingly boring. Neither of those fights offer any semblance of challenge, in large part because low-level skills have been gutted as the level cap continues to increase. I think it would be fair to the players to make the fights themselves even a bit more interactive and challenging, especially the level 15 one. It should show how much of a threat the Asians are in a more concrete way. Suggestion number three, introduce companion accompaniment for the Scions. While it had a bit of a shaky start, companion accompaniment has actually been a highlight of Endwalker. And while I am sure that it would not be easy to do, I think it would be worth it to potentially use this mechanic in A Realm Reborn. One of the big problems with the Scions is that they are not very present in the story when they are not in a cutscene. By having them actually follow you around during their various quest lines, their presence will be much more noticeable, which will in turn help the player to remember them. More than that, it will feel like you are actually carrying out your objectives as a team, rather than as their lackey. This, of course, begs the question if it should be added into the expansions as well, and my answer is, that's not my problem. Suggestion number four, condense the remembrance ceremony. This one seems much less likely, but I ask for it anyway because this quest annoys me to no end. It completely halts all momentum forward and goes on for far, far too long. Either condense the whole thing, or make us choose just one city to visit rather than having to visit all three. Maybe you can add an option at the end to ask if the Warrior of Light wants to visit the other ceremonies. You still get all the information you need for the story from one cutscene. Requiring all three is unnecessary. Suggestion number five, turn parts of the MSQ into side quests. Going back to my example about Hockey Manor, I set up this hypothetical deletion of the content to show how much of a pain it would be for the devs, but there is another option that would be less invasive. Change it into a side quest. This obviously presents its own problems if it's not mandatory content, but I think this might be a nice middle ground. It could be used for the Corrupted Crystals quests, the Buscar and Druthers quests, and the Bacchus Wine quests, just to name a few. The base game is too long for what it is, and still has a bit too much fluff that doesn't add to the overall narrative. Culling the fat will help people feel a faster sense of progression while still giving them all the information they need to understand Eorzea. The extra lore should be just that. Extra. And just for a second here at the end, I want to mention Titan and Garuda again. One really simple fix to the story problems of Titan and Garuda would be to change a single line of dialogue for each. All you would have to do is say they are going to be summoned, rather than that they have already been summoned. This would alleviate both the feeling of interrupted tension and the oddity of seeing them being summoned as soon as you enter the instance when you have been told they were summoned previously. The problem with this is that both of the lines that need to be changed are voiced dialogue. What sort of peril? The worst kind. A tribe of kobolds in the vicinity of Limsa Lominsa has reawakened Titan. 
the Ixal have summoned Garuda once more, and she torments the people of Kurthus as we speak. There are likely legal reasons they can't change the dialogue or leave it unvoiced, so this is more of an observation than a suggestion. It's just unfortunate that the importance of such a small line was overlooked in production. The negative perception of A Realm Reborn is truly unfortunate when you consider that the lead-up to and presentation of The Parting Glass is one of the best moments in the entire game. The setup to Heavensward is so masterfully done once the ball gets rolling. But that is, of course, the caveat that many people are not willing to wait around for. The payoff comes too late for the investment required. Earlier, I mentioned how people don't need a good story to have fun in a game, how there are other things they can enjoy. But I did not mention how the lower levels of almost every job have been progressively thinned out over the years. Personally, I think this plays a rather large role in the perception of the base game to a lot of people. Because if you don't have a great story, you can turn to great gameplay. And if you have only a decent story and decent gameplay, people will get bored and leave. This is the unfortunate conundrum that CBU3 finds itself in. The compromise between focusing on the new player experience and the veteran experience. The splitting of resources between the old and the new. That's why I'm happy to see them make changes to the early game over the last few years, and why I'm hopeful they will continue to make positive changes until, one day, there is no more, it gets good in heaven's word. Instead, it becomes, this is a good game. It's got some hiccups here and there, but it's good just like it was 10 years ago. One more thing I will say before I finish. If you are playing through A Realm Reborn and aren't enjoying it, skip it. Skip the cutscenes, blaze through the quests, buy a skip. If you are really interested in the later game, or if your friends want you to raid with them in endgame content, it's fine to skip it. You can always come back later if you want to. Maybe you never will. But there's no point in telling yourself you have to enjoy something because someone else does, or out of some weird obligation. Doing that will lead to frustration and resentment. Likewise, don't go in telling yourself you are going to hate it because someone else told you that they didn't like it. That's just a recipe for misery. Just take it as it is. Enjoy what you enjoy. Skip what you don't. It's a game. It's an adventure. Have fun with it.